Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's event, featuring Professor Bruce Usher speaking on investing in the era of climate change. I'm Jim Kelly, director of Fordham's Gabelli Center for Global Security Analysis. On behalf of the Gabelli Center, a warm welcome. In the last several years, the Gabelli Center and its wonderful co-sponsors, the Museum of American Finance and the CFA Society of New York, have sponsored more than 50 events that have drawn more than 8,000 attendees. We are tremendously proud of this dynamic collaboration and a full archive of our video content will be shared in the thank you email you will receive. In just a moment, David Cowan, President and CEO of the Museum of American Finance, will give a full introduction to our speaker. Professor Usher will deliver a presentation for about 40 minutes, at which point we will address questions submitted through the question field that is located below the video player. Please feel free to submit questions at any point during the event. We will be addressing as many of them as possible during the session. I also want to share with you that all attendees at today's event will be receiving a digital copy of Professor Usher's book with information coming to you following our event. Now I'm delighted to turn it over to David Cowan. Thanks, Jim. So good to see you, all our friends at Fordham and the CFA and then museum members. Now, climate change is front page news and Bruce Usher is an acknowledged expert voice on the topic. He's quoted in many sources and outlets like CBS News, The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg. His day job is a professor of professional practice as co-director of the Tamer Center for Social Enterprise. And that center educates students to address social and environmental challenges. He holds a myriad of positions at Columbia from the executive committee of the Earth Institute to advising trustees on socially responsible investing. He's the recipient of several prizes for teaching excellence and I know all about this from uh, two nephews who attend Columbia, one in the MBA program, another that is getting a sustainable sustainability management degree about the popularity of his classes. In addition to his teaching assignment, he has authored or co-authored many case studies on the topic and has a previous book on renewable energy. In an earlier life, Bruce was an entrepreneur who worked in financial services, including founding and selling an electronic trading platform. He earned his MBA with distinction at Harvard. The book has been very well received. Publishers Weekly has made it in a top 10 book for business. Now in the book, he quotes the famous Ernest Hemingway from The Sun Also Rises on how do you go bankrupt? And of course, that's gradually, then suddenly. So let's hear from Bruce how to avoid that pitfall as it relates to climate change. It's my pleasure to turn it over to Professor Bruce Usher. David, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction and um, a shout out to your nephews here on campus and look forward to seeing more, more of them around. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with the Museum of American Finance this morning. As you mentioned, my background is in finance. I worked uh, in, in the field and in New York and Tokyo for many years. And it's, it's really terrific to be uh, engaged uh, with you here today. So I'm going to speak for about 30 minutes approximately, and uh, then I'm going to open up to questions and, and happy to take any, any questions uh, from those uh, watching. But let me begin with a question to all of you. And the question I have is, what do you believe has had the greatest influence on business and investors in the past 30 years? And I believe the answer to that question is, is pretty straightforward. The answer is technology, specifically digital technology. Technology has upended every industry from retail to automobiles, from entertainment to telecom. And the impact of technology on business has, of course, implications for investors. If you look back 30 years to 1992, the top 10 companies globally by market cap, only one was a tech company by the way, it was IBM. It's no longer in the top 10. Today, seven of the top 10 most valuable companies in the world by market, by market cap are technology companies. So technology, specifically digital technology, has changed everything in the world of business and investing in the last three decades. 
So now as we look ahead to the next three decades, looking forward, the greatest impact on business will be. And again, I think that answer is pretty clear, and that's climate change. And the reason for that is simply because a global economy, everything we've built and created since the Industrial Revolution of three centuries ago, it all emits greenhouse gases. And actually, that worked pretty well for about 300 years. It allowed humanity to rise up from abject poverty to a decent standard of living for most of the world's population. But as I'm sure you know, a global economy based on burning fossil fuels and emitting greenhouse gases is no longer sustainable. Fortunately, there is a path to avoiding a catastrophic outcome. And that path is shown in this slide here. So this on the left is the latest IPCC report it was published this spring with input from about 14,000 climate scientists. This is the best uh, scientific information we have on climate cheer, change. And it's very clear on what we must do to avoid catastrophic climate change. Catastrophic climate change, by the way, is a warming of greater than one and a half to two degrees Celsius. Beyond that, things get very uncertain and very risky. And the scientific response is simply to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to zero by 2050 or no later than 2070 to keep within a two plus two degrees scenario. So after 300 years of relentless growth in emissions, we must get to zero in 30 years, which sounds implausible. And this chart does cause many people to spare. But here's a really important point, and it's the first point I want to make in, in today's presentation. Client scientists have been consistent with the threat of catastrophic change for a long time. I began investing in this sector in 2002, and it was pretty clear then what the science was telling us, what the risk of climate change was, and what we needed to do to address it. But in 2002, there were very few investment opportunities available to mitigate climate change. We didn't have the solutions to climate change. We just knew what the problem was. Today, 20 years later from when I got into this field, much has changed. It's true, we have much less time to address climate change, but it's also true that we now have the products and the businesses to actually do so. And this is what many people are getting wrong. Our capability for avoiding catastrophic climate change has improved dramatically in recent years. Let me explain this in more depth by starting with four trends that are accelerating this global shift to low, gar low carbon products and business models. And the first of these trends is the most obvious one. It's the manifestation of physical risks resulting from climate change. An example of a wildfire at West and a quote from a Cal Fire, we're seeing in California right now is more destructive, larger fires bring at rates we have never historically seen. Of course, not just wildfires, we're seeing examples of extreme heat, violent storms, chronic flooding, and more. And investors are increasingly aware and increasingly exposed to these risks. And what investors are finding is that these risks are connected in many ways. To give you an example, the wildfire risk isn't just about a property burning down, which is of course, if you own that property or invest in that property, a significant risk. But in a community that has been exposed to wildfires and properties burned down, the homeowners who are still there uh, have struggle to get home insurance. I'm the ones to insure a fire prone area. Well, if you can't get insurance, you can't get a mortgage in this country. And if you can't get a mortgage, then home values fall. And when home values fall, the tax base falls in that community because that's how local communities uh, raise, raise taxes. And when the tax base falls, the quality of schooling and hospitals and the other social services declines as well. And as a result, the value of real estate in that community declines as well, becomes this, this vicious cycle downwards. So this first trend, this manifestation of physical risk is starting to get people's attention and will continue to do so as we see it increasingly manifest itself. The second trend that we're seeing is by term evolving social norms from leaders like Greta Thunberg, simply a high school student who's become world famous, making statements like, I want you to act as if our house is on fire because it is. And she is, and many other, mostly young social leaders are galvanizing attention on climate change, especially among millennials and Generation Z. 
Well, the impact of this for business and consumers is, is it for business investors, pretty straightforward. It's affecting consumer purchase decisions. There's a great deal of academic research showing that consumers, particularly younger consumers, are showing a marked preference for products that they believe are sustainable. And even more, it's affecting employment choices. When I talk to business leaders about the impact of climate change in their business, one of the biggest trends they bring up is that as they hire new employees, particularly younger employees, those employees are making it very clear they want to work for companies that are showing leadership on this issue and sort of in a competitive employment market to get the best employees, businesses need to have a strategy here. So we have manifesting physical risks, we have evolving social norms, and those two trends are leading to a third trend, which is government action. And we have a quote from President Biden on the Inflation Reduction Act. This is the, by far the largest investment ever in America around climate change. And he used that word ever, ever, ever. He likes to use that word. Uh, but in fact, that is true. And it's one of the largest investments of any country ever in this space. But the Inflation Reduction Act is not the only government action going on. There is a great deal of action at the state level. 38 states today have renewable portfolio standards or renewable energy goals. And many of those states are with uh, Republican legislatures. So it's not just uh, Democrats pushing government action on this topic. They may not frame it around climate, they might frame it around uh, lower cost energy or um, energy security, <clears throat> but it still gets us in the right direction reducing emissions. And then at the local level, there's enormous amount of action. Right here in New York City, we have something called Local Law 97, which will uh, reduce emissions from buildings, which is a large source of emissions in New York City. So government action has increased dramatically and not just in the US. We see action being taken by countries all over the world in many different ways, many different strategies, but this is a marked uh, trend as well. So we have these three big trends at the moment, pushing business and investors in the direction of caring about climate change and doing something about it. But that's not the most important trend. The most important trend is the fourth one. In this trend, I simply call innovation, or you could call it technology innovation. So as I mentioned earlier, when I began investing in climate change solutions 20 years ago, there was nothing to invest in. Renewable energy, solar and wind existed, but it was tremendously expensive. I remember looking at the early reports on solar and thinking, this, this is kind of a joke. It's extraordinarily expensive. The amount of power being produced is ridiculously small. In fact, at that time, if you added up all the solar generating power in the entire globe, it was less than one coal fire plant, less than a gigawatt. And then electric vehicles, uh, well, they by and large didn't exist. They were essentially um, golf carts <laughs> back then. There wasn't much there. So today we have uh, climate solutions and the business models to scale them. It's not just the technologies, it's also the business models to, to get them into consumers' hands. They're increasingly available and they're competitive with traditional polluting products. This is the key, that these solutions, renewables and electric vehicles, aren't just better for the environment, they're actually better for consumers. In the case of renewable energy, because they produce cheaper power, and today the International Energy Agency and others have concluded that the cheapest forms of power in most parts of the world today are, are renewable, and or it's a better product. EVs today, in fact, are a more expensive product than internal combustion engine, but consumers prefer them. They drive better, they perform better, they have uh, lower lower costs, uh, lower, lower, lower mechanical problems, and so on. If you add up the commercial solutions that already exist to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, primarily renewables and electric vehicles, those technologies alone allow us to reduce greenhouse gas emissions globally by more than half. That gets us halfway to zero if we were able to implement all those technologies. And technologies are under development to tackle the remaining emissions. I'll talk about that. A little later. Because of these four trends, unsurprisingly, investors are taking notice. Here's a quote, quote from Larry Fink, the uh, founder and CEO of, of BlackRock, the world's largest money manager today. In the near future, and sooner than most anticipate, there will be a significant reallocation of capital. How much capital? There's a lot of forecasts out there. The one I 
folks on my book is from, from Boston Consulting Group, BCG. They forecast 100 to 150 trillion in investment over the next 30 years to decarbonize the global economy and get us to zero. Whatever number you pick, it's a, it's a very large number, um, about two to six times what we're currently investing today in this sector. Which brings us to sort of the heart of this talk, which is what are investors doing to reallocate capital using uh, Larry Fink's comment here. And it turns out that investor reaction to these trends isn't uniform. There are a number of strategies that investors are using, and that's primarily what I write about in the book. I want to explain five strategies and just go through them reasonably quickly. If uh, there's questions on them, happy happy to dig into that. And the initial strategy, the initial reaction to these trends is simply risk management, particularly around the physical risk. Mark Carney, former, former governor of the Bank of England, real leader in this sector. And in 2015, he famously said, the catastrophic norms of the future are in the tail risks of today. By which he meant that many investors up until fairly recently weren't factoring climate risks into their investments because the risks are decades in the future and most investment horizons are a decade or less. But the reality is that asset values today are a function of expectations around future cash flows. And what Carney was getting at is those expectations around future cash flows are going to change as a result of climate change. And the changes that are coming are not just physical. It's not just the physical risks that investors may be aware of. They also may be aware of what we call transition risks. And for businesses, transition risks are actually probably more important. And the transition risks include things like new government regulations that affect the sector, or new technologies that are what we call strand assets, so they're no longer of value, or changing consumer behavior that no longer wants to buy products that are polluting. And then, of course, there are reputational risks that come with all of this. Nearly every business is exposed to transition risks as a global economy decarbonize. So some investors are coming this through purely through a, a, a risk lens and asking themselves, where is their risk that I should be aware of related to climate change? But for some investors, consideration, in fact, for many investors, consideration of risk isn't enough. And they're employing a whole different suite of strategies and I wanted to get into those. And the first of those is a very straightforward strategy, which is avoiding investing in companies contributing to climate change. And that's called divestment. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with the term. And it's based on a very simple idea. Bill McKibben started the movement around divestment about 15 years ago. And the concept is simple. Bill McKibben states clearly if it's wrong to wreck the climate then it's wrong to profit from that wreckage it's a very powerful way of thinking about an issue and as a result the divestment movement has grown dramatically institutions managing 40 trillion dollars today are committed to partial or full divestment of fossil fuel investments and by the way that includes columbia university that picture on the left there of, of all the students holding up signs that's from 2016 Columbia students held a sit-in in President Bollinger's office. Uh, I believe it was the first sit-in since the Vietnam War when, when that, that was kind of a popular thing for students to do. Um, and uh, they, they took over the president's office for, for, for a week, um, which was uh, pretty impressive. And they were demanding that the Columbia Endowment divest from fossil fuels. Well, I have the chair of Columbia University's committee responsible for reviewing divestment proposals. I wasn't chairing it at the time of, of this event. Uh, but I, I later did, and I am, I am now. And uh, the university did end up divesting from thermal coal investments. And last year, while I was chairing the committee, we recommended divestment of oil and gas companies, with an exception for companies with a credible transition plan to net zero. So a divestment is an increasingly popular strategy with investors. The problem with divestment, stating the obvious here, is that divestment is not an investing strategy it's not investing and investors have to put capital to work that's the responsibility of investors obviously to earn a, a return so divestment doesn't get you there that requires a different strategy and the strategy that uh, a great number of investors today are pursuing 
is called ESG. And that's one, again, that many of you have probably heard of and familiar with. Uh, ESG actually has a surprising history. It actually begins with the United Nations. The United Nations, uh, nearly 20 years ago, I was, I was part of this uh, conversation with the UN. Um, Kofi Annan wanted to reset the relationship with business leaders and ideally get, um, get business and investors to start to think about environmental and social factors when evaluating their business investment decisions. In other words, to, to incorporate social value into those decisions. Well, to many people's surprise, certainly mine, possibly uh, Kofi Nunes as well, ESG in investing has really caught on. Mm -hmm. Today, about $35 trillion worth of uh, investment, manage investment management are now factoring environmental, social, and government factors into their investment decisions. Nearly every large asset owner and asset manager is doing this. Question may be why? What's what's driving this? And the answer is that there is some evidence, academic evidence and, and, and evidence from the industry, that incorporating environmental, social and government factors into your investment decisions is simply smarter investing. That companies that think about these issues and are generating better risk adjusted returns, mm -hmm. and then investors incor incorporate them, particularly incorporate material risks and opportunities into their decisions, do better. In other words, ESG investing is simply a more sophisticated form of active investment management in which investors select stocks based on a range of factors, mostly financial, likely to influence share valuations. And now they're incorporating some additional factors into those decisions. And therefore, ESG may be a better way of investing, a smarter way of investing that improves investors' risk-adjusted financial returns. And there's evidence that in some cases it appears to do so. And there's fairly strong evidence that, in fact, it lowers volatility in returns. And if you dig into this issue of risk-adjusted financial returns, by lowering volatility, you, in fact, improve your risk-adjusted return. The problem with ESG is, however, there's in fact little evidence that ESG investing is better for the environment. It appears to be better for companies and better for investors, but it may not have much impact on climate change. And the reason for that is ESG investing isn't designed really to mitigate climate change. For that, investors who are primarily focused on climate change, there's a fourth strategy, and that is called thematic climate investing. So I have here a quote from Nancy Fund of DBL Partners. And she wrote, building great companies that also help to solve some of the core challenges of our age is not an oxymoron. And she writes that because until companies, until investment funds like DBL were started, the assumption was that if a company focused on a great social challenge like climate change, it wouldn't do very well as a business. And what Nancy and others found is that, in fact, if you're very thoughtful about it and really know a lot about a sector like climate change and the subsectors within that, say, renewable energy or electric vehicles, there are some very, very uh, successful companies that can come out of those sectors and do very well for investors. Nancy Fund and DBL were one of the first investors in Tesla. And Tesla now being the most valuable car company in the world, obviously the invest, the investment worked out fairly well for them. They also invested in a number of other climate mitigation solutions. And the companies they invested in have clearly contributed to addressing climate change. Whatever you think about Tesla as a company and how it's run, its success as a business has changed the entire transportation sector. GM reached, recently announced it is going all electric by 2035 and every other automobile company on the planet today has gone electric and that really is because of tesla's success when i say success i mean their commercial success and their success in investors unsurprisingly the financial success the financial returns have been generated by firm by funds like dbl and dbl has done very well and there are many other um, funds like them today their success has caught the attention of the world's largest money managers 
And today, nearly every large asset manager has one or more thematic climate investment funds. In fact, there was a funny moment about a year ago where TPG, one of the world's biggest funds, and Brookfield, another one of the world's biggest funds, two enormous PE firms, on the same day in July last year, announced they've got, they were launching the world's biggest thematic climate fund. One came out in the morning and then in the afternoon, the other one came out with theirs. Um, so there's been a real sort of piling into this sector because what these investors have found is that by focusing on a theme thematically on climate, there are a lot of opportunities that can be profitably invested in. But even thematic climate investors even they cannot finance all climate solutions because some of the solutions we need are too risky and too early stage for fiduciary investors, for those who must maximize risk adjusted return. And that's why I just touched on when I began my presentation that the technologies we have today, like renewables and electric vehicles, get us about halfway to reducing our emissions. The other half, many of those technologies are still pretty risky in early stage. So to finance those, we need a, another strategy, and that's our fifth and final investment strategy today. And that is called impact first investing. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so the best known impact first investor today is Bill Gates. Quote here saying, we're willing to wait a longer time for returns than other funds. Bill Gates established Breakthrough Energy Ventures. And the quote kind of sums it up. Impact first investors provide patient capital. They're willing to wait longer than other investors. They're willing to take risks that a commercial investor with fiduciary responsibility simply cannot handle. Gates founded Breakthrough Energy with the objective of getting climate technologies to commercial scale. And after that, traditional investors can provide further capital. And Breakthrough and other impact first investors like it are financing technologies like green hydrogen, direct air capture, sustainable aviation fuels, and other risky but potentially game-changing solutions to climate change. Unfortunately, though too risky for your typical investor. So I've just described five investment strategies and every investor, small or large, can and I believe should select one or more of those strategies as we enter the era of climate change. I also have several specific recommendations for investors, and I just want to throw those out here now. And these apply ir irrelevant of strategy. These are all, all things to keep in mind. And the first is when we talk about investment opportunities, I previously said there are commercial opportunities, those that already can compete with existing products. And there are pre-commercial products, the sort of thing that Bill Gates Breakthrough Energy is investing in. If you're looking at investing in either one of those, you need to think about the key issue to focus on when you look at companies with those products. With commercial products, you need to invest in companies that are really good at scale. It's all about scaling, scaling profitably and effectively. With pre-commercial products, it's all about investing in companies that are really good at innovation. And these skill sets are very different. So one needs to keep that in mind as you consider these opportunities. The second general recommendation I would make is investors are successful here when they consider the trends. This is all about trends. The current markets aren't that big or that profitable. If you think about the electric vehicle market, it's still relatively small, somewhere between 3% and 5% of the market at the very moment. But the trend here is extremely positive. In fact, maybe not just a linear trend, maybe entering an area of an exponential trend, which is very beneficial to investors. And there's the issue of what are the barriers? There may be trends that are very beneficial, but there may be some barriers that will show up. We're seeing a lot of barriers at the moment around supply chain, for example, and the resources needed for these companies. There could be barriers around infrastructure that's required. For example, electric vehicles require charging and charging is challenging because it requires installing physical uh, stations. And in many cases, that's actually very slow to do, even if, when the capital is available. So understanding the trends and the barriers to mass adoption that are being created by those trends 
makes investors more successful in this sector. And lastly, this issue of winners and losers. And I, I, I always hesitate to use that term winners and losers because it's somewhat a controversial uh, way of framing things. But the reality is that this transition to zero, globally, this net zero transition, it's going to create winners and losers. And that's just part of the economic process, particularly in modern capitalism. And as an investor, it's really important to consider who is likely to be the winner in any sector that you consider investing in, who's likely not to be the winner. And we generally put winners and losers into two buckets. There's disruptors who are new to a sector and they're incumbents who are the existing companies in that sector. The disruptors tend to win, and this is a generalization, but they tend to win when the incumbent companies face organizational change in order to compete. And the classic example of this is Tesla versus General Motors. You know, Tesla did not invent any particularly amazing new technology. They took the lithium ion battery that everyone was familiar with. They packaged 7,000 of those batteries together and they put it into a car. In fact, the first automobile they put it into was, was a Lotus. It wasn't even their, their automobile frame. And that's what they started selling. GM clearly had the resources and the expertise to do that. Why didn't they? And in fact, why did it take them more than a decade to actually get serious about this, even during the time that Tesla was clearly showing the opportunity here? And the reason for that is that incumbent companies, large incumbent companies, really struggle with organizational change with with moving away from a product that they're very familiar with and that's profitable for them and that's their weakness where incumbents do well is in regulated markets and or commodity markets because they have very very significant advantages in those markets a classic example a much lesser well-known one than tesla and gm is company called two companies called Sun Edison and Next Era. Sun Edison was a disruptor in the energy markets. It had a solar business and it became an enormous success. It became a darling of Wall Street. It grew very quickly. Its market value uh, grew into the, into the billions. And it was sort of taking on the utilities. It was signing up customers to uh, install solar and use solar behind the meter, which meant they didn't really need the utility much anymore. Well, uh, Sun Edison spectacularly went bankrupt in uh, 2016, I believe it was, one of the largest U.S. bankruptcies of all time. And around the same period as Sun Edison was growing, a uh, not very well-known uh, Florida utility called Florida Power and Light decided, they looked at what was happening, looked at the trends, looked at the opportunities, and started investing in renewable energy, primarily solar, and started to grow. That company's now called Next Era. It rebranded itself. Next Era today is the largest owner of renewable energy assets in the US. More importantly, it's now the most valuable by market cap, most valuable utility in America. And in fact, it at one point um, was the most valuable energy company in America. It was, it was more valuable than Exxon. That's slight, slightly uh, less now. But next year, the incumbent in this case really was the winner because they have real advantages in these regulated commodity markets. And the last the last recommendation I have, and I'll wrap up just a minute here, is for investors, it's better to act early than late when it comes to climate change. In other words, you want to invest prior to a Minsky moment. A Minsky moment is named after economist Hyman Minsky, and it describes a point in time when there's a sudden change in market sentiment that inevitably leads to a market crash. Minsky himself, unfortunately, passed away in 1994, but his theory became widely known during the Great Recession of 2008 and the subprime market crash, when suddenly investors all revalued subprime mortgages and, and the market crash. As an investor, you want to exit a market before every other investor collectively decides to reprice, reprice assets in the market. Decarbonization will change nearly every business everywhere, and that will create winners and losers in the business world and among investors. And great wealth will be made and lost and the transition is going to play out over the next few decades. Which is important to know if you're an investor. 
But there's an even more important issue. And the question is, that issue is, will it matter? Will we avoid catastrophic climate change? And I get that question uh, frequently. And what I tell my students is we can. That doesn't mean we will. We can because we have the technologies to do so. As I've said earlier, we're, we already have the technologies to get us halfway there, the commercial technologies. And those other technologies for the other half, they exist. They're not just figments of people's imagination. They're just not yet at scale or at price points that make them uh, feasible at scale. But they're developing very rapidly. And as for the capital, 100 to 150 trillion sounds like a tremendous amount of capital. But in fact, in the very deep and liquid capital markets that exist today globally, the capital is available for sure in the developed markets. Developing markets are a little more challenging, but it's certainly feasible. But that doesn't mean we will address climate change. And the difference fundamentally comes down to one of timing. The timing of our investments is going to make all the difference here. You know, if we had 100 years to address climate change, there really wouldn't be an issue. We would be able to do that, I think, very easily. The IPCC report that I mentioned to in the beginning of my presentation sums up that we need to get to net zero. That report is 3,000 pages long. That's a long report. Thankfully, the New York Times summed up the whole report, in my estimation, with this headline. Stopping climate change is doable, but time is short. Avoiding catastrophic climate change is a timing issue. And what you find in that report is this graphic. It shows us that there are several paths to getting to zero, but all of them start pretty soon. We only have 10 years to start reducing emissions. Now, there are many countries, by the way, today that have already started reducing emissions fairly dramatically. Emissions in the U.S. peaked in 2007. We actually are already on this downward path, uh, even more so in Europe and some other countries. But globally, emissions are still going up. So globally, we have to hit that down. The good news, though, is the report also finds that if we do follow any of these paths, the temperature will stabilize by 2050. And it will stabilize below 2 degrees Celsius in terms of increase. And that should allow us to avoid any of the worst outcomes of climate change. So let me just wrap up. What are the implications for investors of all this? In the future, climate change will impact business globally, much as technology has in the past. It will create winners and losers in nearly every sector. The low carbon transition will provide investors with the opportunity and the challenge of a lifetime. And investors, oh, excuse me, investors rising to that challenge is critical if we are to avoid catastrophic climate change. So let me just conclude by telling you why I wrote this book in the last minute here. This is right at the preface of the book. My hope in writing it is that every investor, individual and institutional, will recognize the changes that are coming and act. Because in doing so, you'll benefit yourself, but you'll benefit all of us as well. So if you're an investor, small or large, I would ask you to ask yourself, what will your role be in the era of climate change? I'm open to questions. Uh, thank you for that clear, coherent, and at times uh, sobering uh, remarks, Bruce. Thank you very much on behalf of all of us. We've got a lot of questions that are that are coming in. I'll start with one from our own friend, Professor Chatterjee, uh, talking about that technology was the driving factor in the last 30 years. Now ESG is the driving factor in the next 30. Um, but people are thinking this might need new technology or innovative technology. What kinds of technology innovations do you see? Uh, any policy recommendations also you could recommend? Okay, there's a lot of layers to that question. So I'll take it fairly quickly because I see a lot of questions up there. The, 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 poly, the, the technologies I'm, uh, I think are most exciting uh, are green, green hydrogen. Um, I, I would put, well, let me actually back up for a second. I would say energy storage is pretty exciting because the lithium ion battery is being advanced in a lot of, a lot of different ways and making it that much less expensive, uh, moving away some, min some minerals that are very limited, uh, like cobalt, for example. Um, and so I think there's great advances there. But in fact, those those advances are already, we're, 
we're already at the commercial phase there. The ones where we're not commercial yet that are most exciting, I would say, are green hydrogen and direct air capture. And I put them in that order. Green hydrogen, there is a path to getting to a commercial uh, feasibility green hydrogen. There's still a long ways to go. Uh, but if we get there, the potential for green hydrogen basically takes us from, you know, it, it solves all the hard problems that are left for us. It's, 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 it's viewed as sort of the, the Swiss army knife of climate solutions. It solves our ability to reduce emissions in the steel sector, which is very problematic. It could be used for air transport. Uh, well, uh, Airbus is working on, on planes flying with uh, green hydrogen. It works in home heating. It works in so many different ways um, that if we can get it a uh, cheap enough cost, then we're really on a great path. Uh, direct air capture is a tough one because, in fact, it's extremely costly, and that path is very uncertain. I'm not sure we'll ever get it down to quite where we need, but it allows us to, to deal with what's left. And direct air capture is removing CO2 directly from the atmosphere, taking back the, the you know, the pollution we put up there. And uh, this is very hard to do and very expensive. But at the end of the day, there's always going to be some emissions left over. It's very hard for anybody to get truly to zero. And so direct air capture is a really important area as well. I'm going to leave the policy part of that for two reasons. I'm not a policy expert, and, um, and I want to take more questions. <laughs> That's a good question. OK, Bruce, here's a, a question from uh, Carl Amici. What about China not participating in this? I mean. The U.S. is part of the problem, but China, India, and some, a lot of other big countries yeah. are not on board. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's you know, what do I worry about here? I don't worry about our ability to continue to innovate to get the rest of the technologies we need. I have great confidence in that. I don't worry about our availability of capital today. The capital is, is available, in fact, living these solutions. What I do worry about is the rise of nationalism globally. And that at the end of the day, climate change is a global problem. Economists refer to it as a tragedy of the commons, which means we all share this commons, the atmosphere, and we're all polluting the commons. And at the end of the day, we do have to have some cooperation to, to address this issue. And here, the trends are not good. They're negative. <laughs> They're going, we're going the wrong way. Uh, in the 20 years I've been involved with this. And the, and the reason we're going the wrong way is that is the global order is, is, is breaking down somewhat. And that's because of the rise of, of nationalism everywhere, by the way. This is a, this is not, I certainly wouldn't call it any particular country because pretty much every country is, 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 is doing that. They're hunkering down and not cooperating much globally. So what do we do about that? Well, there's, there's several things. One is try to structure so it's everyone's best interest to cooperate globally. And the best driver of that is manifestation of these physical risks. So China may not want to take action. But by the way, I'll get to China, what China's doing in a second. But if they're suffering from climate change, and they are in, in some ways, uh, they will be incentivized to take action just as we are. We're starting to see countries like India really suffer from climate change. Of course, Pakistan in particular but uh, India because the, because of heat and intense heat. And you're starting to see countries that previously said, look, we have to continue to industrialize. Our economies aren't wealthy enough. This this problem was caused by the rich world and, and we're not on board with this. They're starting to recognize that they have to take action as well. The other way to think about this is that while the optimal scenario is the US, China, and every other country would cooperate. The other alternative here is we don't cooperate, we continue to compete. But in this case, we're competing for the lowest cost solutions. In other words, if transportation is going to be all electric one day, not just because it's better for the environment, but because it's a better way of, 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 of transportation, it's more efficient, it's a um, better way of doing it. Renewable energy is going to be everywhere because it's cheaper. It's also much safer, by the way. I mean, safer, that's distributed, doesn't, you know, have problems with supply, you know, you don't have problems with uh, uh, sourcing fuel and things like this. So from a competitive position, even when we just take away all cooperation, there are many reasons why China and India and other countries are likely to advance 
their decarbonization of their economy too. But I don't want to minimize the challenge here. This this challenge of of countries not you know not cooperating on climate change is by far my biggest concern. And again, if we had a century, I wouldn't worry about it. Given that tight window, this is uh, this is a challenge. Harrison asks a question you probably get from your students a lot. What skills or capabilities would you suggest be prioritized for those who are looking to make a career in the ESG finance space? So the very, and I do get that question a lot. You're, you're absolutely right. And uh, it's a great question um, because I think it's pretty straightforward. That, that first of all, the skills you have to have are good, strong finance skills, good investing skills. Um, get your, your finance and investing basics through your education and, and ideally get experience in, in, in finance. Because fundamentally, those who are really good at finance are really good at investing in these climate solutions. That's a prerequisite here, right? Got to be a good investor to do this successfully. The understanding the sector, understanding the climate science, um, I don't want to minimize how important that is. It's clearly important, but you can pick that up later. You can you can get that a little later in, in your career as you as you enter this area. So 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 get get really good at finance. That, that's what the sector needs. Um, unfortunately, it's starting to get it. We're seeing more and more people or, you know, more traditional investors, um, you know, worked at many of the big firms or many of the big funds, and they're starting to move in this direction. And I think that's a terrific thing. Okay, Bruce, here's a question from Carl Buhlman. If we pursue the strategy of divesting from fossil fuel investments and starve energy producers from needed capital, can it be argued that we will in in inadvertently cause unacceptable levels of inflation in manufacturing, construction, agriculture, transportation, due to higher fuel and feedstock prices. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, but let me unpack it a little bit because, in fact, the problem with divestment is it doesn't actually starve <laughs> fossil fuel companies of, of capital, and there are several reasons for that. The first reason is to, is to recognize that the fossil fuel industry only about ten percent of it is in public hands. Okay, 90% of it is either in the hands of private investors or much more commonly, most of fossil fuel industries in the hands of, of, of sovereign entities, national oil companies, right? That's where most of the reserves lie. I mean, there's Saudi, you know, Saudi Aramco is technically a public company, but it's really still a you know, sovereign company. So first of all, the divestment that we're talking about is only targeting at 10% of the industry. Secondly, for that 10%, anyone who divests shares means that someone else, if for every seller, there must be a buyer. There has to be. And so what you're really doing through divestment is transferring your ownership, if you're divesting, to someone else. And that buyer, clearly is not interested in divestment because they bought these shares and they're willing to provide capital. The third challenge is that there's some perverse outcomes with divestment, which is by selling your shares to someone who no longer cares about climate change, there's no longer that dialogue with management to say, look, you guys are emitting fossil fuel, you know, you guys are emitting greenhouse gases. Can you do something about that? Can you invest in carbon capture and storage or green hydrogen or some other solution here? So that voice is lost. When it comes to proxy votes on climate change and the like, you lose that voice. There is a very limited scenario where when enough investors divest, the companies in the sector have struggled to raise capital. And the one example we have of that is the coal industry in America. Coal companies have been going bankrupt in droves. Uh, 2017, several of the leading companies, or 2019, Several of them went bankrupt that year. And of course, some fingers are pointed at investors' divestment. But that's not what drove them bankrupt. You know, driving down the stock price, if you can do that, squeezing capital is painful to the owners, but it's revenues and cash flows that put companies out of business. Coal companies have gone out of business because people don't want to buy their coal. <laughs> and utilities are not buying coal because it's an expensive way to generate electricity. The, cheap, the two cheapest forms of electricity generation in America today are natural gas and renewables, wind and solar. 
you know, coal is coal is pretty much finished in this country. It's it's heading downward. So, a, a long way of saying that this this issue of divestment and starving capital. I I, I wish that was the issue that. The starving capital really does put pressure on these companies and therefore we could think about is it inflationary and what do we do about that but in fact i think there's virtually no connection there uh, i'm going to combine a couple of questions uh, marie is asking how do you view the anti-esg movement we've been seeing and then carl pushes back saying look in the 70s it was an ice age scare in the 80s it was uh, at the rain scare in the 90s it was ozone layer scare you know, here we're dealing again with estimates. So how do you deal with the pushback? Yeah. So I think there's two very different uh, issues there. And this latter one is, you know, how do we deal with questions around climate science? And, you know, honestly, I, 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 I don't. I'm like, you either believe science or you don't. I happen to believe scientists. I happen to believe experts in the field. Um, the science is extremely clear and extremely consistent. And the reason for that, by the way, um, the thing about climate science is at the end of the day, it's pretty simple physics. Let me get right down that. The greenhouse effect warms the planet. And in fact, without it, it would <laughs> this would not be a, a hospitable planet to live on. Um, if someone refuses to believe the science, I, I, I don't have anything to say to them. By the way, just as an aside, and I want to get back to that question about ESG. You know, there are two there are two sort of groups that I um, I really don't have much to say to in the sense that if someone denies the science of climate change, I say that's science. But there's also a, a group that's growing fairly dramatically at this point, which are those who we. Um, are not in the denial, denialist category, they're the opposite category. The, they, they believe the science to such effect that they become defeatist. They've, they've looked at the, 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 the situation and said it's hopeless. We can't do anything about it. And the extreme manifestation of that are people are saying, I refuse to have children because I think we're not going to solve the problem and it's hopeless. We're all going to die. Uh, that doesn't help either, by the way. <laughs> It doesn't help us at all but the simple reason that if we just lay around being defeatists uh yeah we're we're not going to address this problem and we're going to be in a really really bad way uh we can address this problem um eventually we will address the problem we'll have to we'll probably do it late and poorly uh but being defeatist is not not at all the way to do this and and i i have quite a lot of frustration with that point of view as well the question about ESG is, 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 a, is more of a interesting one in the sense it's, it's very contemporary, right? In the last literally few months, we've seen a lot of pushback against ESG investing. And this pushback has come particularly from politicians. And it's interesting because of two things. One, it's, it reflects a real misunderstanding of what ESG investing is. And, um, what I would summarize it is, I think these politicians are really good. They're very smart politicians. They're very good at politicking. I don't know if that's a real word. Is that a real word, politicking? Anyhow, they're very good at, at that job. I don't think they're very good investors. <laughs> and the reason for that is ESG is, is a very simple concept. It's, I'm going to put my money into something, and I'd like to know everything that's material to that asset possibly. That's possible to know. And then, why, and then I'm going to use that information to decide how much of the asset is worth. And a classic example would be if you're thinking about buying a house, would you want to know if that house experiences any flooding in the basement? How often? How often is a flood? Is the flooding getting worse every year? Uh, how costly is it to clean up that mess every year? What are you going to do about it? That's ESG investing. It's knowing whether your asset is at risk from these factors and what whoever's running that asset that company is doing about it and you'd be kind of an idiot to ignore these factors right in fact I, there's there's plenty of legal scholars have written you you're 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 not fulfilling your fiduciary duty if you ignore these factors the other part of the whole debate around esg the, the part the irony here which i mentioned in my presentation is that well on the investment side esg is kind of just smarter investing 
on the environmental side, it actually isn't all that much smarter at all. Now, it, it, ESG investing is having very little impact on climate change because it doesn't, it's not directly focused on mitigating climate change. It's focused on reducing risk to companies and investors. And ultimately, we got to put capital in mitigating emissions. That's, you know, essentially what my book's all about. So I think ESG investing is just fine. It's a good thing to do if you're an investor, if you're, if you're clever. Uh, I don't think it's, you know, the solution to climate change. And that's why there's just so much rich irony in these, these political uh, comments. But again, I'm not a politician. I wouldn't be very good at it. <laughs> Bruce, I'd like to ask you one myself, if I may. What what is the possibility of developing public-private partnerships to address this issue, like we did for COVID vaccine creation? Yeah, yeah, that's such an important question. Uh, and yeah, so, first of all, as we did for COVID vaccine, you know, it comes with challenges, right? And again, we get in the land of politics and and you know misunderstandings and then debates about science and things like that. But let's let's just set that aside for a minute. Public-private partnerships are incredibly effective when done right. I mean, I, I do think, you know, the COVID vaccine is one of the greatest accomplishments of all time. And that was a true public private partnership. And, uh, you know, I think credit should go to the Trump administration for, for making that happen. Um, just an incredible success story. And I, I don't think many people really understand that. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity to do it here as well. And, and what it comes down to very simply is the government looking at a problem, understanding where the barriers exist that are, that's, preventing the private sector from moving as aggressively as possible to innovate or scale, right? What is business good at? Business is really good at innovation. Business is really good at scale. And, and the government needs to make sure that business is doing both those things on whatever problem may be, whether it's COVID or, or climate change. And a public-private partnership can figure out, okay, where's the barrier? For example, COVID, the government said, if you create this vaccine, we guarantee, you know, exit billion doses that we you, you will sell and right they did that to 10 companies even knowing that not all those companies would you know they'd have too much vaccine if everybody got it but that was okay that's the role of government to take on that risk and there's many opportunities to do that in climate change particularly around developing countries so i only touched on this just briefly in my presentation due to time limitations if i run this out here but it's hard to get capital in developing countries, and you really need public-private partnerships to overcome some of the challenges, the you know, the, the additional risks that come with investing there. Long way of saying, too, public-private partnerships really important part of all this, um, but of course fraught with the challenges that every time the government tries to do something, there's 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 challenges to that. Uh, my final question before Jim can either ask one or wrap up um, has to do with cryptocurrency. And do you have feelings on it, given the drain on the grid? How does that juxtapose uh, with what you've talked about today or does it not? You know, let me be begin with I, I am not an expert on crypto uh, or use of the blockchain more generally for, you know, other other other, other uh, things like transactions and, and making uh, markets more efficient. What I will say is that any technology that increases emissions greenhouse gas could take us in the opposite direction of decarbonization is a problem today and particularly if that technology is potentially going to grow at scale so crypto in its current form although we just saw a change with uh with ethereum um is extraordinarily energy attend and uh, intensive bitcoin certainly is and i think that's an enormous problem that's that's clearly going the wrong direction and i've yet to see an argument as to why the value of that product more than compensates for the emissions, right? There's always gonna be some emissions around a product and you could say, well, we, we increase emissions, but the value to addressing climate change is greater in the long run and here's why. And I haven't seen that spelled out. So my takeaway is uh, it's a problem and we're gonna to have to solve that problem or I don't see you know, a good future for crypto. Well, Bruce, on behalf of everyone, let me thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. And I would like to invite everyone watching to join us again, same place, same channel, at uh, Thursday at noon for our next event, which will feature a fireside chat between Jonathan Brolin, founder of Edenbrook Capital, and Roy Barron of the Merger Fund, on the subject being merger arbitrage. Until our next event. Goodbye, and thank you so much for participating.